Um, so let's, I think to, we can move on to the next uh, patient. This is a 59-year-old male who presented with left varicocele. Uh, he also had a uh, cough for six months, fatigue, and occasional fever and uh, night sweats. And he felt a mass in the left side of his abdomen. Uh, and as we said, he presented with left varicocele. The labs were uh, normal except for a male. He was slightly anemic. And the case of the chest uh, showed metastatic disease. Here is uh, the two views of his uh, left renal mass. And you could see that it's a large mass arising from the left kidney. And uh, uh, I believe there is a compression here of the left renal vein. Uh, you see another view here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wood, would you like to comment on uh, left varicocele, the significance of this in a middle-aged or an elderly man? Uh, yeah, any, you know, if a, if a man during you know, self-examination or by examination from their uh, physician uh, that there's a new varicocele, uh, abdominal imaging is indicated because it indicates uh, the, the, the left renal, or sorry, the left gonadal vein or left testicular vein comes off of the left renal vein. And varicocele means that there's back pressure that's filling up that vein and causing it to distend. And so it's a sign of a potential uh, intra-abdominal pathology. So they should have abdominal Im imaging if they feel or identify uh, a new varicocele. Uh, and in terms of this patient, how I would manage no metastatic disease, uh, I would do a radical nephrectomy. I would probably do it through an open approach. And the reasoning for that is, number one, the tumor is so huge that by the time you make the incision to take it out after, you know, doing it laparoscopically, you made the incision that you would do it open through. Uh, but I'd also want to make sure that I do an adequate node dissection on this patient. Dr. Batin, is there a uh, size cutoff where you would not recommend a laparoscopic uh, robotic approach? It varies a little bit on the configuration. Once you get to above 11, 10, 11, 12 centimeters, you know, the benefit goes down pretty quickly, like Chris said. Um, so, you, you know, and, and some of it just depends on how it's configured and how bulky it looks. But roughly about 12 is definitely the upper limit of, of when you lose the benefit, and sometimes even as less as 10. Okay. You know, the only other point I'd make on this case is that you know, the audience might be saying, well, why don't you give them some of that medicine that you gave those patients this morning to shrink it? And the answer is, again, that's in the context of a clinical trial that's not standard of care. Uh, and, you know, until we better iron out, you know, how well these agents work, when is the most appropriate time to use them, upfront surgery still remains the standard of care. Um, so you would uh, do a left uh, nephrectomy here. Would mm -hmm. you do a uh, adrenal gland sparing or you take the left adrenal gland? Well, so you can see in the picture, and Nazar, if you could point out with the arrow, the left adrenal gland phenotypically is normal on the scan. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I couldn't argue against taking out that adrenal, uh, but, uh, um, you know, with locally advanced disease, particularly since the, the, uh, on the left side the adrenal vein empties into the left renal vein, you actually have to go out of your way to try and save the adrenal as opposed to on the right side where you have to, where the, the venous drainage is right into the vena cava. So I probably would take the adrenal gland with this just because of the locally advanced nature of the tumor. Okay. All right. So the patient underwent a left radical nephrectomy with uh, resection of the visible lymph nodes and the adrenal gland was removed uh, with the kidney. The pathology, as you see here, clear cell kidney cancer, formal nuclear grade 2, T3A, and 0M0. The nodes were all negative. Now, what would you offer this patient, Dr. Harrison? Uh, would you offer the, the patient any adjuvant uh, therapy? So as we discussed this morning, this is another case of a patient who's at high risk for recurrence. Um, however, adjuvant therapy is not standard of care off of a trial, so I would try to talk, the, talk to the patient about possibly enrolling in an adjuvant clinical trial. So and we discussed this morning uh, about, you know, the surveillance studies, the interval. Uh, how often do we do scans and uh, or imaging studies? Do we do an ultrasound, as we, we discussed in Europe, they, that's what they're doing? Or do we use an MRI or we use a CAT scan? And how often we do a CAT scan of the chest or we just do a plain chest X-ray? So uh, the patient was followed with serial imaging. He was without evidence of disease, that's the NED, no evidence of disease until 22 months after surgery. And um, he presented with, you know, what you see here, a tiny pulmonary nodules, nodule, 
you see it here. And 28 months later, after surgery, uh, he has these uh, few pulmonary nodules, sub centimeter in size, Sorry. in the left lung. Dr. Pile, what would you do? Uh, would you offer him uh, systemic therapy, metastasectomy? Uh, you continue to follow. The patient is completely asymptomatic. He is healthy otherwise, yeah. except for uh, mm -hmm. essential hypertension that's well controlled with blood pressure medicine. Yeah, I, I, this is, I would be a compelling ca case to consider removal of uh, the lung nodules to send it to radi surgery because it took two years to show up with this. Uh, solitary lesion, so if it's only the only spot, maybe it's not, but I think uh, with two years uh, interval, you can make the case. So, so I think uh, definitely I would uh, discuss with the patient uh, the option for surgery. Dr. Harrison, do you, uh, would you recommend systemic therapy? No, I would not, and I think, you know, this is a patient where maybe we could avoid the chronic toxicity of targeted therapy. You know, the patient has some features that Roberto pointed out. So two years since surgery, um, it's a solitary metastasis in the lung, so there's some retrospective studies showing those may be factors, you know, indicating that they could benefit from surgery. So I would, I would recommend the surgery and, and try to avoid systemic therapy. No, no high dose out too? No, okay. not at this point. So the patient uh, was sent to thoracic surgery and had a left thoracotomy and resection of these pulmonary nodules, that's what this medical term means, metastasectomy. A total of six nodules were removed from the left lung, two of which had metastasis, so there were uh, tumors, uh, two out of the six, but the margins were clear. Now he is, uh, again, without evidence of disease. Is there anything we will do, uh, Dr. Pile, now? You, would you do anything after the complete resection? So the, the standard of care is observation. So okay. just have the patient recover from surgery and, and watch him. Okay. Um, there is an ongoing trial, I think it's already open through ECAG, uh, where they're gonna offer, um, I think it's gonna be randomized placebo versus posoperative. So what's the role of, uh, of this agent that block the blood supply to prevent uh, further metastasis? So I think if that study is available, to the patient, I would uh, refer to that trial, otherwise observation. Okay. So eight months after the uh, resection of these lung nodules, um, you, you could see uh, he was being uh, followed, but now you can see there's some nodules appearing again. You see here. So there are small lung nodules appearing in both lungs now. He has bilateral lung nodules. This is 11 months now after he had resection of these uh, lung nodules from the left lung. What do you recommend, Dr. Harrison? Would you continue to observe? He's asymptomatic. Would you send him for systemic therapy or would you do another metastatectomy, this time bilateral lung nodules, bilateral thoracotomies? Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that the time frame from his last metastasectomy being so short and the bilateral nodules, that kind of rules out another metastasectomy or, or in other words, resecting nodules from both sides. Um, so I think that this patient is going to need systemic therapy. And then, you know, this is similar to one of the cases we discussed prior. You know, is it wrong to maybe watch for a couple of months and see what happens? It's probably not. But on the other hand, we hate to miss a window. And uh, this is another patient where the patient is young, I would be thinking about high-dose interleukin-2 based on the patient's wishes. And of course, there would be other, other systemic therapy options too. Dr. Pili, you agree? Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I'm always uh, reluctant to start treatment if, if uh, the tumor is very small. Um, so, you know, this patient would not qualify probably for a clinical trials because we need to have a certain dimension, at least one centimeter, in dimension of these nodules. So if it doesn't fit the criteria for a clinical trial, probably I would still not start uh, systemic therapy. But I would agree with Dr. Harrison that eventually he will need it. Dr. Wood? I mean, uh, you know, call me surgeon mentality, but I mean, I think that uh, um, this guy would be perfect for high dose IL-2, and that's where I'd refer him. I think, you know, it's clear he's got metastatic progression. 
He's got small volume disease. He's in excellent health. He's uh, uh, got a zero performance status. This is the classic candidate for high dose IL-2. Uh, you know, admittedly, there's toxicity, but if he's going to be cured, that's his only shot. And uh, if it were me or my father, that's what I would do. So the patient uh, we discussed. I, I, I would I would do the same, Dr. Wood, but I was you know I, again. Um, um, Waiting sometimes, even for immunotherapy at that stage, uh, probably is not going to be harmful. I think the patient eventually will need to be to have a systemic therapy. But um, I'm a strong believer high dose interleukin two, and that's why we have also a clinical trial with IL two and Tinostat. But you know, again, the unfortunately the uh, complete response rate is still very low, and so it's a lot of toxicity. Uh, and sometimes the patient is a patient that go and get it, you know, type of uh, mentality, you jump on the treatment. Some other patient might be a little bit more laid back, and, um, but at, at the end, uh, I think the IL-2, if he's a candidate, I think is the best option for him right now. And I think for, for, uh, for the people in the audience, uh, this is a, de a decision that's always made, uh, you know, uh, with the physician and, and the patient and the family. So, uh, obviously, you... Uh, we present all the options, high dose interleukin-2, uh, target therapy on protocol, off protocol. Uh, we discuss all the side effects, and I think ultimately the patient and the family will come together with the physician and decide what they want, uh, how aggressive they want. Are they willing to go through the uh, risks of high dose IL-2? And I think it's, 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 it's a personal decision. I think uh, we uh, discuss these options with the patient and uh, uh, jointly, we made the decision to treat him with high dose IL-2, and that's what he's getting uh, next week.